We'll do that Saturday morning. All right. Well, let me pray for us. <clears throat> Lord, we, we're so blessed to be able to come into this place. It's cool in here. Uh, we've been able to sing. We've been able to fellowship with one another a little, to share prayer concerns and updates of people who are important to us. Uh, and now it's a great privilege to be able to come into your presence, to intercede on behalf of these folks. So first we want to begin by saying uh, how blessed we are, how thankful we are, that you would... We are so honored that you would be mindful of us, that you would pay attention to us. We give thanks, Lord, and we praise you, we worship you, we honor you tonight, Lord. You are worthy of all the adoration that we could give to you. And Lord, we come before you uh, with these names that we've mentioned and the names that are on this list. Lord, there are things tonight that have gone unsaid. And you are aware of all of these things. And so, Lord, we ask for your will to be done. We ask for healing, for comfort, for mercy, that you would provide for the needs of these folks. Remind them that you are close to them, that you love them dearly. And Lord, I pray for your will to be accomplished. And we pray that you would speak to us as we study tonight. Lord, may your will be done in our lives. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Last week, began to talk to you about spiritual disciplines. So we're going to uh, continue. We spoke last week about uh, just having a time each day set aside, devoted to being in the presence of the Lord. A lot of people call it quiet time, but you can call it what you want. What's important is that we've set aside time just, you know, on a daily basis, if we can, uh, to spend time at our altar where we can meet with the Lord, worship Him, and uh, listen to Him responding. So we talked about that last week. Tonight, I want to talk to you about prayer. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Nehemiah's prayer, Nehemiah chapter 1. And I almost hesitated, it's hard to do just one study on prayer. So, it's likely, we'll do this, we'll go on and we'll talk about some other things, and then I'll probably come back and we could spend more time talking about prayer itself, because what we're going to do tonight, barely if it scratches the surface what the Bible tells us about prayer, and it's important to us and our walk with the Lord. So tonight, we're just going to look at Nehemiah's example of prayer and see what we can learn from that. When I talk to people about prayer, usually uh, the frustration that's expressed is people feeling like they don't spend enough time doing it. Is that common for you? wish you know, people, there's this longing or this desire, I wish I would do it more. Uh, Pastor, I sit down and I get distracted, my mind wanders, the phone rings, I fall asleep, whatever. You know, there's all kinds of things that, that work against us. And usually there's this desire to do it more. I think that's universal. Uh, <clears throat> and then... You know, Paul tells us that we're supposed to pray without ceasing, which has this idea uh, as we go throughout our day of being in the presence of the Lord and paying attention. And so if we try to do that, you know, we're spending quite a bit of time in prayer. And so what is it that we think we should be doing that we're not doing enough of? And, uh, it's a very complicated subject for people in uh, prayer. Uh, I've seen more fights in churches over prayer than just about anything, uh, because there are so many different opinions about it, and how we should do it, who should be doing it, and when, and where, and uh, I guarantee you, uh, I could start a fight tonight <laughs> over prayer, but I won't. 
And I could ask, I, I even have in mind the very question I would ask. Uh, but we should move on. No, no, no. I didn't get this gray hair by asking those kinds of questions. <laughs> uh, it's, I've endured longer by being wiser. All right. Nehemiah provides an excellent model for Christians. And he gives us some things that we should take seriously regarding how we approach the Lord in prayer. And you know his story, uh, Nehemiah, he faced a lot of pressures day in and day out, depending, I mean, that had to do with things that happened on a grand scale in the history of Israel. There was... Uh, prejudice and racism in the land towards God's people that he had to face. There was apathy among his own people, the constant pressure of building projects and all of that. He was a manager. Uh, on top of all of that, he was uh, a servant to the king of Persia, the most powerful man in the world uh, at that time in the history of the world, Artaxerxes I. And he was a cupbearer to the king. Uh, he probably felt like he had responsibilities in Persia that he needed to be attending to, but he was in Jerusalem trying to rebuild the walls of the Holy Land. He's pulled a lot of different directions. All right. In the midst of all of that, the man gives us three at least different examples in his book on how he prayed and sought the Lord. They're all worth looking at. We're going to look just at the first example in the book of Nehemiah tonight. Uh, tell you what, let's just look, we'll read the text. Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They're, they are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And then he adds a footnote, I was cupbearer to the king. All right, into chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? 
Then the king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Okay, so all this takes place after the kingdom of Assyria had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel and carried those people off into exile and had transplanted foreigners to live in what was formerly the kingdom of Israel. And they intermixed, and uh, that's where the Samarians, the Samaritans, sorry, came from. Are you following me? Okay. And so. This all takes place after the kingdom of Babylon defeated the Assyrians and then they started, you know, flexing their muscles in that part of the world and they invaded the southern kingdom of Judah and carried those people away into uh, exile in Babylon. And then while they were still there, uh, the Persians rose to power and they uh, became the dominant power in the land overtaking the Babylonians. And uh, the Persians began to let people return to the lands from where they had been displaced. So many of the Jews went back to the Promised Land and occupied uh, Jerusalem. What kind of a, what kind of a, a report do these Jews give to Nehemiah about the condition of things in uh, Jerusalem? Okay, walls are destroyed. The gates are no more. What happened to the gates? Uh, and then, what, what does he say about the people who live there? They're in disgrace. They're in disgrace. What else? They're in great trouble. Yeah, they're, they're in trouble. They're oppressed. Things are not going well. And they're in disgrace. Why were they in disgrace? More or less, that's probably right. Uh, they were outnumbered. You know, foreigners were living in the land still, and they did not want the uh, the Jews to come back and take possession and rise to power again. So they were actively working against them to keep that from happening. And uh, uh, all in all, the those who were returning from exile were having a rough time, and. Uh, Things did not look well. All right. In verse 4, there are several verbs which demonstrate Nehemiah's distress over the condition of things in Jerusalem. So what are those verbs? What do they tell us about Nehemiah's heart and attitude toward God? What does it say he did? And what does it show us? Well, okay. Okay. He sat down, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and then he prayed. So what does that tell us about what's going on in his heart? He says he sat down. Have you ever been so shocked by some news you got that you had to sit down? And that's kind of what the language says was going on with Nehemiah. 
he wept, and then uh, you have the idea that he wailed, he mourned, uh, he was moved deeply. It says that he fasted. Uh, We'll talk about fasting later on. Uh, Some of us, you can look at us and tell that we don't do a lot of that in our spiritual disciplines. But he was so distraught that he couldn't eat. And then he probably also made himself fast as a way of focusing his attention on God. It was probably an emotional response and also a discipline that he practiced as he processed the news that he got. And then he said that that he prayed. Um, So in verse 5, what does Nehemiah recognize about God's character? Okay. Okay. It's interesting that he's not blaming God. Uh, God's obviously sent him back, released him back, but he's not condemning God or blaming God for not taking care of the restoration himself, leaving it to them. Yeah, that is interesting. So Lewis says that. It's interesting to note, especially at this point in the prayer, he's not. there's no words where he's blaming God or he's expressing or venting his frustration at God for allowing things to get to the point that they have. You know, why, don't, why don't you do better? Now, he'll say some things to God that are extraordinary in just a moment, and we'll look at that, but there's, still, there's no blame there, and I think that's right. Uh, this is not God's fault. So what does he say? Um, He uses the uses the word well at the end of verse 4 he says then I prayed to the God of heaven Uh, no wait a minute I'm looking in the wrong place it would help if I was in chapter 1 it makes a big difference All right, so in verse 5, he says, O Lord, God of heaven. So you see where it says, O Lord? In in my Bible, all of the letters are capitalized. When all the letters are capitalized, what does that mean? All right, it's the name for God, Yahweh, the the, the holy name. And so he's he's addressing him in a very personal and uh, very... uh, it has the idea of, of, of relationship. God revealed his name to Israel, you know, to Moses, for Moses to teach to Israel. And it said something special about their, their covenant relationship with one another. And so he's, he's addressing that personal relationship. And then he calls him the God of heaven, which was a phrase that was Persian. So this is likely the way that the Persians spoke to their deities. And this is probably evidence of uh, Nehemiah being raised in a foreign pagan culture, being influenced by it. He addresses his God the way that he heard the Persians addressing their God. But he says, you are the the God of heaven. And it's meant to show that uh, you you are indeed someone who is empowered and enthroned on high. And then he clarifies it and says, you know, you are the great an awesome God. So here, this is Nehemiah's appreciation of who God is. Uh, you're great. You are awesome. Uh, for Nehemiah, he is addressing someone who is to be feared, respected, someone who's to be trusted, and who's to be approached carefully. You know, you don't just pop off to someone with so much majesty and power. Someone who's to be taken seriously. And he uses, in English, it's translated awesome. Uh, How is God awesome? I think that's a word that's overused in our culture. Everything's awesome. These cough drops are awesome. (laughs) I think think it means more being awestruck. Okay. uh, At the the radiance and the glory of God. Marcy says it has... Probably the idea of more of being awestruck at the radiance and glory of God. And I think that's spot on. 
I think that it's, it's the language, it's language that's meant to describe the impression that God's total character leaves on those who encounter him. They are awestruck. Do what? Yeah. Uh, God is not just someone you didn't notice. He leaves an impression on you. you know, you're, you're awestruck. Uh, the, the fearsome presence of God le- leaves an impression on you. And so, uh, Nehemiah expresses those kinds of ideas in, uh, in, his, in his prayer to the Lord. Um, also, what's the order of Nehemiah's prayer? What does he start with? Praise God to you. All right. I think that's significant. He starts with praise, and then he gets into the, the petitions that he wants to make. Both aspects of prayer are important. We talked about that some last week. But uh, I, I think it's significant to note that he starts with praise. And then he, he says something else that's significant. What else in verse 5 does he say and describe? How does he describe God? Those that love God will keep their commandments. And God will love them as well. Okay, and why would he do that? All right, because he says in verse 5, you are, you are the awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love and obey his commands. God keeps his covenant. All right, we've talked about this before. In Hebrew, what Nehemiah says is that uh, God is, is faithful. He uses the word chesed, which describes God's covenant love. His faithful love, which means that even when His people wander off and go astray, is God going to go, nah, and walk away? No, God stays with them. He stays committed to them. No matter what, God keeps His word. And because of that, His people are saved. Your salvation, my salvation, does not depend on our ability to keep our covenant with God perfectly. Aren't you glad? Because God is perfect on our behalf. and He keeps His covenant. And so that's, that's what Nehemiah is saying here. Um, God is loyal. He is faithful to us even when we are disloyal and unfaithful to Him. And as a result, God shows mercy and love to His people even though they are rascals and probably don't deserve it. Anybody here, can you make a legitimate claim on God's love? Do you have a good argument for it? Probably not. And that's chesed. That's God's faithful covenant love to you, no matter what. Then Nehemiah also uses language here that indicates that those who love him will obey his commands. And so, uh, we are also part of this covenant relationship. God has given His people His Word. He knows we're not going to obey it completely, but He expects us to take it seriously and to, uh, to know His Word, to understand His Word, to obey His Word, because His Word is an, an, an expression of His will for us and for the world in which we live. And so... Uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah's language emphasizes both realities. We are to take seriously the word of the Lord, but even though we fall short, God is always faithful and keeps His promises to us no matter what. All right. In verses 6 through 7, uh, what do we see about Nehemiah's character and his understanding of his in, in Israel's relationship with God. He recognizes that the whole nation has sinned. Okay. He recognizes the sin of the nation. And does he just throw Israel under the bus? He includes himself in that? My father's house? Yeah. And uh, 
I think that it's an interesting thought. And I don't know, we could probably, this might be another question I shouldn't ask. I'm going to ask this one. But how much do you want to be held responsible for the sin of the people in the United States? And this every day. <laughs> really? Really? Let's be more specific then. What about the sin of the people in Aransas County? Do you want to be on the hook for that? Your neighbors? What about the people in this church? You want to be on the hook for all of our sin because I didn't have the best day. Right? I mean, how much, how much do we really want to be responsible for one another's sin? Probably not much. And yet, Nehemiah understood it was his sin and the sin of the people together that mattered to God. It's a strange dynamic. So, on one hand, I am absolutely only responsible for my sin. I'm not going to be condemned for yours. But when it comes to repentance, in Scripture, there's this, there comes a time when we all must repent. Together. I'm responsible for my sin. And I'm only held accountable for my sin it's good news, trust me, that you won't be held accountable for my sin. But repentance is something that has a corporate element to it. And I know we've been praying for rain. What does the Bible say has to happen in order for the Lord to send rain? Everybody has to. We have to the people have to repent. And so maybe we should take that seriously. So it's not washing my jeans. <laughs> or I'm not sure, although that has been a strange coincidence, right? All right. All right. So, <clears throat> you know, is, is the nation of the United States ever going to collectively repent together? I'm not, I'm not going to hold my breath. But like right here in our community, as, as a church even with other brothers and sisters in Christ scattered across the, the community, there might be occasions where that it would be the most appropriate thing for us to do. I guess my point is that we tend to be so individualistic in our Western culture that we think about who's responsible for sin, and it's true, I'm only responsible for mine. But repentance is something that I do, and there's also a corporate element as well. Uh, maybe we should seek out occasions to where we would gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and say, you know what? We were wrong. We blew it. And uh, rather than wallow in the mire, we simply want to turn and, uh, and go in this new direction. And I think there's something very meaningful to that. Uh, Job, I mean, uh, Nehemiah, says that the people had acted wickedly. And this is a word that has the idea of offending. And so, Nehemiah was speaking to God here as to a master. He's offended by disregarding his commands. And he says, it's not just me, it's all the people. We have all disobeyed you. And that cuts right to the heart of the matter. Uh, we, we had your word. We didn't take it seriously. Uh, that's why we went. That's why we had to be disciplined. That's why the exile occurred. We've returned to the Holy Land. Things have not gotten better because we still haven't taken seriously your word. You know, it, it, and he recognizes that. Uh, there are serious, probably, consequences. There, I'd say they're probably serious. They are likely serious. There are definitely serious consequences when we disobey the word of the Lord, especially his ethical demands. This is how you are to live day in and day out. When we don't take that seriously, there are consequences. I think that many of the problems in our culture today that you and I experience
probably would be avoided if we would obey the word of the Lord. Amen. You and I, and those with whom we live in our times, have gotten really good at finding ways to not obey the word of the Lord and explaining why that's the right thing. If we would spend more time simply doing the will of God, we would probably avoid much of the trouble that we encounter and cause for one another. Do you agree with that? Yes. Right. So, <clears throat> when Jesus made this point, when uh, the Pharisees came and asked him, you know, there was a man who was married to a woman, he died, and then his brother married her, and he died, he died, he died. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? You know, because of the whole issue of divorce. You know, and Jesus basically told them, you guys should spend more time obeying the word of the Lord than trying to explain when you can get divorced and when you can't. You know, uh, take seriously marriage, is what he was saying. And, and, and I think that's true across the board for us. We should, uh, anyway, take seriously the word of the Lord and the fact that individually and collectively we fall short. And so repentance is both an individual and collective thing. All right. In verses 8 through 11, how does Nehemiah apply God's word in prayer? All right. Okay. So Nehemiah has been to Sunday school, and so he knows Deuteronomy chapter 30, and that's what he's quoting from here, verses 2 through 4. And uh, he's reminding God of promises that God had made through Moses about the covenant relationship uh, with Israel. So, what was the agreement that God had with Israel back that he made with Moses? What does Nehemiah say? If you're unfaithful, I'm going to scatter you among the nations. Okay. What, what happens if you repent? I'll gather you all back here. Right. And so several times in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, uh, the books of Moses, you have God saying through Moses uh, to the people, I'm making this covenant relationship with you. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm expecting you to do. If you will just do this, everything will be fine. But if you don't do this, then I will discipline you because I love you. And I'll try to bring you back into a right relationship. And there are times where he says, you know, I put two, two paths before you. Choose life. You know, do the right thing. But he knows they're not going to do the right thing. And so... He gives them this promise of hope through Moses that even though you disobey, a bad thing is going to happen. If then you repent, you'll be restored. And so Nehemiah is going through the files in his brain and he remembers all of that. And so he says to God, you said that if we would repent, you would restore us. And, uh, and, and, and we would be, you know, we would receive back what we had lost. Uh, in our sin and disobedience. And I think that's extraordinary. Uh, the word of the Lord formed Nehemiah's prayer in this regard and allowed him to even go and say something bold to the Lord and hold him to it. You know, there's a sense of accountability here. You made us this promise. When are you going to keep it? You know. I think any time that our prayers can be shaped by the Word of the Lord, we are praying the right way. Um, I think I, if, I'm going, if I'm going to speak, uh, the more that I can know the Word of the Lord and allow God's Word to shape how I address the Lord, then the more in line I'll be with God's heart and mind. Know how to pray how to listen, what to listen for, what to look for, and then how to be obedient to the Lord of the Lord. What are your thoughts about that? Praying according to God's Word. It's a good idea. Yeah, it's good. It's good. All right. It, it can be hard. People don't know God's Word anymore. Yes, so 
It's hard to pray according to the word of the Lord if I don't know the word of the Lord. That's true. That's why scripture tells us, one of the reasons why it tells us to hide his word in our heart. So that especially when we may be in prayer, that the spirit can call those things up. And the Lord can speak to us through his word as we are praying. Uh, You've often heard that in in teaching about prayer, the acronym ACTS, or uh, sometimes people add two C's, A-C-C-T-S, which stands for Adoration, Confession, Consecration, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And I think we see these examples in Nehemiah's prayer. He begins by praising God, by voicing adoration. He confesses his sin. He consecrates himself to be obedient to the word of the Lord or to whatever God wants him to be. He offers thanksgiving. He prays for his people. So, uh, A-C-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, consecration, uh, thanksgiving, and supplication, or praying for others. It's a good way for us to, uh, or to keep that in mind as we are praying. In chapter 2, as Nehemiah begins his conversation with the king of Persia, what impresses you about the discussion that Nehemiah has with the king? Okay. That the king even cared. All right. Pretty extraordinary that the king noticed and cared what was going on. What else? He said a short prayer before he started to speak. All right. He sent out uh, this uh, this uh, this little dagger to the Lord in the moment before he uh, made his request to the king. Uh, There's also an indication that he's wrestled with this for several months, and Nehemiah mentions the passage of time, which to us, if you don't know the Jewish calendar, you you don't really, can't really appreciate what he says, but he indicates about four months have passed since he has uh, received the news about Jerusalem, and he has this opportunity to speak to the king of Persia. So Nehemiah has been wrestling with this for some time. He's not being impulsive. But he's been seeking the Lord about all of this for some days, day and night. Uh, persevering in his prayer. And planning. Because he knew what he needed. And he asked for it. Alright, so when he did have the occasion, you can see it's kind of in degrees. He, he, he says this one thing, uh, you know, if it would please the king, let me go back. And the king responds positively. And then he says, well... If that worked, what about this? Would you give me letters? And if that works, would you help me to get some timber? And, you know, the, he, know, he has in mind exactly what he needs. He's given this some thought. And the Lord perhaps has put it on his heart. He knows he's been paying attention. He's been watchful. And so he knows how to act. And he knows how to speak when the time comes. And I think that's also a result of the time that uh, he had spent in prayer. What impresses me most, I think, about what Nehemiah says in chapter 2, which is connected to how he prayed in chapter 1, but it's his willingness to go. He's so burdened by the condition of things. He's so convinced that God's going to keep His promises and fulfill His word that he's bold enough to make this request to the king of Persia to place his own life at risk to go back to the Holy Land to do the work that God wants him to do. Having the cavalry helps in that, I know. But he, he's so serious and committed to this that he's not volunteering someone else to go. He's willing to go himself. And that, it's so huge. So when I pray, I, I am praying in supplication on behalf of other people. But I think there's an understanding that as I'm praying and interceding for people and for God's will to be done, I'm telling the Lord, here I am, send me as well. I'm willing to be a part of the answer. I'm not saying, Lord, this is a mess. Good luck with all that. I can't wait to see what you do next. Like I'm eating popcorn, waiting to see what God's... You know, I want to be a part. I'm committing myself to be 
a part of what the answer is. And Nehemiah gives us an example of what that looks like. All right. Yes, he was definitely burdened for the people, for God's fame, for God's word, for God's purposes, and he was willing to do what, it, what was necessary, what he could do in order to help all of that to be accomplished, all of God's work to be accomplished in that part of the world. It's an extraordinary life, Nehemiah. All right, we've covered a lot of ground on prayer. <laughs> he definitely knew how to address the king of Persia. Yep. Why, this is a, a big wonder. Why God chose to use Nehemiah, who was up in Persia, Babylon, uh, as opposed to what he did to Gideon, who was, you know, and in the middle of the trouble. I'm just, uh, there's yeah. probably not an answer to that, but I just, I wonder why, the, why the different approach to Yeah. I don't know if you heard it, what he, his question. Why would God, what, and, he, and Lewis said, there's probably not an answer. So, God used a different approach with Nehemiah to address the situation in Israel that he did with other Old Testament characters like Gideon, who was on the scene. So why not raise up somebody who was local instead of using someone who was far away, you know, in Persia to address the situation in the Holy Land? It's a good question. Wouldn't have gotten the lumber and the beans and things. It could be a matter of resources. Yeah. I'm actually going to pull something up I learned in one of my classes. All right. Should I sit down? So, uh, so between ne uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, Ezra was more of the... Uh, priestly, you know, type of thing. But Nehemiah, his gifts were really based in civic duties. And I think it was the way that God gifted him that he was the one to go and to do that part of it. Uh, that he, he was the one that could get that job done because of what he did once all of the, the walls were built, you know, the cities were built. He was more civic minded. I think there's something to that. And of course, uh, this is all speculation. But I think it has to do with the geopolitical realities. Um, uh, Nehemiah in Persia, access to the king and the king's resources, probably education and training and the things that Marcy's talking about, where the exiles who had returned to Israel were probably no resources, no training, uh, no practical skills to get those kinds of things done. And, and maybe needed somebody to help motivate them. You know, they needed help. It just so happened that there was help available. In this they part. may have just been so distraught in their condition. You know, they were, yes, they, and they weren't in a spiritual condition to do anything. Spiritually, and also, uh, of course, that's true, and politically as well, the other nations had no interest in Israel restoring itself, so they were working against them, as the book plays out as well. Yeah, Linda? But when God chooses, Yes, and really, uh, there are things in the heart and mind of God of why he chooses some and not others to accomplish his purposes. It makes sense to him. It's wacky to me, you know, and I question, but uh, the Lord does what he does, and uh, uh, he's wise, and he's always right, whether I understand or agree with what he's doing. I object. And Moses learned that, didn't he? Yeah. Yes, Bill? Yeah, I'd be interested in realizing that you, you think he's wacky. <laughs> uh, I, I always think that when the Lord calls me to something, that he's made a poor choice. <laughs> There's someone else, Lord, who can do it better. Yeah.
it could be likely that God's people at that point in history thought that God had, was done with them, and they were miserable, and that it was over, and there was no hope, but because Nehemiah had been to Sunday school, he remembered God's promises, you know, and God allowed that, you know, he stirred him up, and uh, helped him to fulfill some, some promises that were, you know, a couple of hundred years old by that point, so what else? Down through the ages, God has called people to roles of leadership. And they, now, he called them, I think he called them Nehemiah, I believe that. But Nehemiah also accepted that call and stepped forward. And what a difference in leadership makes in our land. The study of kings is about leadership. Yeah. The, as the king went, country, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it's an important thing. Now, uh, leadership in our local church is important. And we have leadership all the way up there. And this was a man who saw a problem and saw that he had been called because God made it evident to him that this was something that needed to be done. And he put forth the step forward and did it. And we see it when we go through Nehemiah, leadership time after time. Yeah. He he saw solutions. That's right. That's good. Yeah, Rick. I thought Nehemiah was extremely bold in, in when I read it in the uh, version that I've got. I looked at yours in the six and eleven in chapter one. He says, "Let your ear be attentive, to speaking to God." Well, mine says, "Look and listen carefully." It's like a parent would say to a child, you listen to me. That's right. And I was here. I thought I was seeing a little lightning bolts flashing here, but it's just a reflection <laughs> from my glasses. The light. Yeah. It, it's probably an expression of his passion. Uh, he, Nehemiah was taking all this seriously. He, he was, the Lord had stirred him up. You know. Yeah. But would he not think that he's paid attention? I mean, it, he already knows what he's going to say. Yeah. So. Well, I can't explain how people address the Almighty. <laughs> what they think they need to say. Well, he's bold enough to speak to the king. Right? Yes. Well, that's true. What else? All right. So we'll come back another time and talk some more about prayer. Uh, but this is a subject that you'll never reach the bottom of. So, all right, let's pray. We'll be done. The Lord... You are indeed a great and mighty God, and we are honored to be in your presence to be able to meet like this, as I've said. We are thankful that you've met with us, that you care about us, that you are faithful to us. And Lord, we do fall short, and we live in a world that has everything. And sometimes we are distracted, maybe led astray. We may be tempted to give up hope. Or to forget your promises. And so we ask God for the grace to stir within us, to remind us, to speak your word within us again. And bring us to life. Bring us back to you. Focus us on you and your word, your ways, your purposes in the world. And Lord, as we seek you out, pray that we would also offer ourselves to you. So that we can be a part of your purposes in this world. That you might use us for your glory for your greatness and your fame. So Lord, I ask that your will would be done in the lives of these here and those who are watching online. May you bless them and show yourself to them so that they may know you and take great delight in you. And we love you, we trust you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.